So people are not really used to dark humor on my social media because I remember posting a joke that said when you switch off the machines in the ICU so that the patients can actually sleep better. It was only meant to be a joke. Some of you took it seriously. But anyways, this is a video that I have been waiting to do for a very long time. Been putting data together slowly so that I can simplify everything for you guys and you can have a good understanding of the basics. Take note that this is not going to be a super in-depth lecture on mechanical ventilation. It's just going to be pretty much the basics to help you understand such that when you do your own reading and you're going to the chapter further and further, you'll be able to have a good understanding of the different strategies that we use to ventilate patients in our high dependency units, in our COVID wards, in our ICU, as well as in theater. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at mechanical ventilation. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Apologies in advance because this may be a very, very long lecture. So I really hope to get it done in under 40 minutes. So remember, there are three terms that I want you to keep in mind. I'll just remind you of the basic physiology. There is what is known as ventilation, which is abbreviated as a V, perfusion, which is abbreviated as a Q, and oxygenation. So when we talk about ventilation, it's just simply movement of air between the lungs and the rest of the environment. So it's pretty much the flow of air into and out of the alveoli. Remember that for this air to flow through inside the lungs and out of the lungs, there has to be certain changes in the volume, certain changes in the pressure. When someone is inspiring, their muscles are contracting, their rib cage is pulled upwards and outwards, so the volume of the entire thorax is increased. Remember that volume is going to be inversely proportional to pressure. So this, even in conjunction to the pleural cavity, there is a negative intrapleural pressure that is created, and this is going to be forcing air into the lungs. When someone expires, the muscles just relax and these, this elastic recoil, it's like a rubber band which stretches back or rather pulls back and this decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity. It increases the pressures inside the airways. This forces air out of the lungs and out of the airways. So the process of exchange of air from the alveoli and the environment is what we refer to as ventilation. Perfusion, on the other hand, is the flow of blood to the alveolar capillaries. Remember that the capillaries inside the lungs react differently to the presence and absence of oxygen as, as compared to other capillaries in the rest of the body. Remember that in the lungs, when you have a lot of oxygen, it's not really um, rather a good thing because this may lead to damage so if you have a lot of oxygen high oxygen tension it may cause actually vasoconstriction in the lungs and it may actually cause even shunting of blood to some extent we shall see this in one of the settings on the event such that we don't want to keep the concentration of oxygen very high in this patient because we may stimulate formation of new radicals or rather oxygen free radicals then on the other hand in terms of hypoxia the blood vessels inside the pulmonary vasculature tend to vasodilate in relation to that so the flow of blood to the alveoli is pretty much a perfusion because this allows the oxygen to be carried away from the alveoli towards the tissues and carbon dioxide to be brought to the alveoli so that it can be exhaled there is a normal ventilation to perfusion mismatch or an ideal ventilation to perfusion mismatch in the lungs. And remember that in the different zones of the lungs, different there are differences in ventilation and perfusion. In terms of oxygenation, it's just simply delivery of oxygen from the alveoli to the tissues in order to maintain the cellular activity. Remember that these three processes are largely going to be affecting the acid-base balance in the body and they may be affected by different disease states. <clears throat> 
Now, just a little bit about the ventilation before I go into details of ventilation. So way back in the second century, there was a Roman physician known as Galen, who was actually one of the very few people that did some sort of ventilation. I don't know why, I don't know why they were breathing into dead animals, but they somewhat did with a reed, breathing into the larynx of a dead animal. And this was pretty much the first, or oh, some of the few first methods of ventilation. Later on, uh, the author George Poe actually used the mechanical respirator to revive an asphyxiated dog. So there have been some further advancements in the field of mechanical ventilation. Uh, Drinker, as well as Shaw, had invented the iron lung. So this is like this chamber that was created. And once a, a patient is placed in this chamber up until the neck, this creates a vacuum inside the chamber. And once this vacuum has created, remember you create a negative pressure, kind of like a sucking pressure inside the same chamber. And this is going to be in relative to the rest of the atmosphere. So it means that within the chamber, there's going to be less pressures because you have created a vacuum. So this will cause the chest wall, it will cause the lungs to expand. And remember when the lungs expand, it means that now the pressures inside the airways are going to be less and then air is going to easily flow into the lung. So this is what was referred to as an iron lung. It's not so practical because it you can't really move around with it. It's quite cumbersome. It's quite expensive to build. So this is where usually most of the ventilation that was done with these tanks is what is known as negative pressure ventilation because you're creating that negative pressure. But nowadays with advancements in medicine, as well as those people that fly jets, there are certain techniques that were developed to give them oxygen, even though they had high partial pressures or rather high altitudes. These methods were adapted to the machines that we use nowadays. And these are going to be using a type of ventilation, which is known as positive pressure ventilation, where you're applying a positive pressure to force air into the respiratory airways. So this is what the... Uh, iron lung actually looked like and it's going to be creating this negative pressure within the vacuum. Ventilation was very important especially during the, the polio era because you know that these respiratory paralysis that could come with the condition and patients needed to be ventilated in order to keep them alive. So remember that in terms of respiration it consists of two main cycles. There's what is known as inspiration which is moving air into the lungs and expiration which is pushing air out of the lungs so remember at rest inspiration is an active process so meaning that it's going to be carried out by certain contraction of certain muscles it's going to use up energy these muscles are predominantly the diaphragm which is accounting for about 75 percent of the effort so once the diaphragm flattens and of course your the, the volume of the lungs is increased and also your intercostal muscles contract especially during exertion they're going to pull the ribs they're going to pull the sternum upwards and outwards and this is going to increase the volume and air is going to flow in because the pressures are less than compared to the atmosphere then in terms of expiration it's just simply due to elastic recoil so the muscles relax and then the Remember when you stretch a rubber band and you let it go, it'll snap back. So the same thing in the respiratory system, they'll snap back. And this is going to result in passive movement of air out of the lungs. So remember at rest, inspiration is an active process. Expiration is a passive process. It becomes different during exertion because both expiration and inspiration are going to become active processes and they're going to need energy and contraction of muscles during these um, phases of exertion, during these respiratory uh, cycles. This is very important to know because the more these muscles are contracting, the more energy they are using, the greater the work of breathing, the greater the distress this patient is going to be in, and this patient is using up a lot of energy, which is why mechanical ventilation is aiming to reduce the work of breathing for the patients. And like I already explained, the during inspiration you create this negative intrapleural pressure that's going to then cause uh, a gradient to be created between the environment as well as the alveoli such that the alveoli will have a much less pressure as compared to the atmosphere and this actually causes air to flow into the lungs now in terms of mechanical ventilation remember this is quite important to actually sustain life in the acute setting so it's going to be used by many clinicians and healthcare workers to provide vital function such as 
providing airflow into the lungs to keep patients alive. So it's quite important for you to have a very good understanding of this and to be able to apply it safely without causing the patient any complications or causing them any trauma. So remember, like I said, most of our machines these days are going to be using positive pressure ventilation and this is going to be dependent on compliancy how well can the chest wall how well can the lungs be expanded how well can they be stretched and of course the resistance to the airway because remember anything blocking flow of air is going to offer some resistance even just the elasticity of the lungs if they're less elastic it means that they'll be less compliant it means that there's going to be a higher resistance i'll talk about this a bit later on so this positive pressure ventilation is going to be involving these airways that are going to be given this positive airway pressure it could be applied through the endotracheal tube it could be applied through your tracheostomy tube and you're just simply forcing air into the lungs and then eventually the ventilator breath is going to be terminated and then expiration is going to happen passively so remember as this pressures decrease when the ventilator has stopped pushing in air then the elastic recoil is the one that's going to be responsible for pushing out all of this tidal volume out and this patient actually exhaling so it means when the patient is connected to a vent there'll be a limb that is coming from the vent which is known as an inspiratory limb there'll be a tube that's going from the patient to the vent which is known as the expiratory tube or the expiratory side so in terms of ventilation, it could largely, you can think about it as two main types. Is what is known as invasive ventilation. So this one obviously is going to require you to do some invasive procedures such as intubation. We will discuss on a different video how to intubate patients safely. And this is going to be entailing placement of an endotracheal tube. And this endotracheal tube is going to be connected to the vent. In this particular lecture, we're going to be talking about invasive mechanical ventilation. In another video, if you want me to do another video, we're going to talk about non-invasive ventilation where pretty much we're going to be talking about CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. I did talk about CPAP in the pediatric setup. I'll leave the video tagged at the end of this video and as well as BiPAP which is the bi-level positive airway pressure. We will discuss this in another lecture and I will do a separate video if you do want me to do this. So remember that mechanical ventilation is going to be considered in certain special clinical as well as laboratory uh, scenarios and it's ideally for a patient that's not able to maintain their airway or if you deem like this airway is dynamic and at any time it can be lost or compromised then you would want to intubate your patient and put them on a mechanical vent or if there's uh, inadequate oxygenation or inadequate ventilation. So there are some common things that may jolt you to thinking that this patient may benefit from mechanical ventilation. These include things like a respiratory rate above 30, inability to maintain the arterial oxygen saturation greater than 90 with the patient on a fraction of inspired oxygen greater than 60%. Uh, pH that is less than 7.25 that's the severe metabolic or severe uh, acidosis rather then a partial pressure of carbon dioxide that is greater than 50 unless if it's chronic and stable if it's an acute setup then you are going to be worried so this decision for you to take and to say this patient needs mechanical ventilation is actually not just based on just specific numbers or these numbers that I've given you you must put everything into perspective because you shouldn't wait until the patient is about to die for you to decide to put them on a vent so the, what are the stages of mechanical ventilation? Largely, there are four stages. It's what's known as the trigger phase, the inspiratory phase, the cycling phase, as well as the expiratory phase. So the trigger is just simply what is initiating the machine. So it's going to be initiated by either the patient or the machine itself can trigger itself in certain different types of modes that we'll talk about. There are certain parameters that you can set on the mechanical ventilator to trigger and push in an amount of air or to push in air at a certain pressure or sometimes it could be triggered by the efforts of the patient and once the machine has been triggered then there's an inhalational phase where inhalation of air or air is forced into the patient then there's a cycling phase just the moment after the inhalation has stopped just before ex exhalation happens is what's known as the cycling phase and then this is going to be later followed by an expiratory phase where there's passive exhalation of air from the patient
Now, the indications of mechanical ventilation could be divided into four main groups. We have those that have airway disease compromise, those that are hypoventilating, those that have hypoxic respiratory failure, and those with increased ventilatory demand. So what do I mean? So if someone has airway compromise, so in patients that are comatose, obtunded, and those that have a dynamic airway, for example, someone has been exposed to airway burns. You know that airway burns are going to be associated with some edema, so you want to intubate them quite early and ventilate them early enough. Maybe someone has an oropharyngeal infection. It could be airway obstructions that could either be proximal in terms of angioedema or distal, like for example, asthmatic bronchospasms or even acute exacerbation of a COPDs, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. In terms of hypoventilation, think of it like this. It could either impair the drive, the central drive that's stimulating the respiratory stimulatory centers. It could be a failure of the pump or it could be an inability of gaseous exchange that's going to be resulting in this carbon dioxide retention and this hypercapnic respiratory failure. So things that could cause impaired central drive include drug overdoses, alcohol intoxication, patients that come into the low GCS less than eight. They may be too weak to have even breathing efforts. It could be due to respiratory muscle weakness, like for example, muscle dystrophies, the myositis, it could be an acute myasthenic crisis, it could be due to some peripheral nervous systems like Guillain-Barr syndrome or even myasthenic crisis like I've already talked about. Or some restrictive ventilatory defects like, for example, the chest wall trauma. It could be certain other diseases or even sometimes a massive pneumothorax or an effusion. In terms of hypoxemic respiratory failure, remember here there's a problem with inability to exchange oxygen and to deliver it to the peripheral tissue. So it could be things that are affecting the alveolar failing defects like pneumonias, acute respiratory distress syndrome, pulmonary edema, all these are indications for mechanical ventilation. You could also have pulmonary vascular defects leading to ventilation perfusion mismatch. You could have things like massive pulmonary embolism, things like air embolism, even diffusion defects like in advanced as pulmonary fibrosis. Remember that this is despite you having adequately oxygenated a patient. Remember that these different oxygen devices that we can use before we actually make a decision that this patient needs mechanical ventilation. It could be due to increased ventilatory demand in conditions like sepsis, shock, or even severe metabolic acidosis. Now, some of the common indications for mechanical ventilations are going to include things like bradi bradypnea, a decrease in the respiratory rate, or apnea with respiratory arrest. It could be due to acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress, tachypnea, that's a respiratory rate greater than 30 breaths per minute. If the vital capacity is less than 15 mils per kg, if the minute ventilation is greater than 10 liters per minute, if the arterial partial pressure of oxygen with a supplemental fraction of inspired oxygen is less than 55 millimeters of mercury, if the alveolar arterial gradient of oxygen tension with 100% oxygenation is greater than 450 millimeters of mercury, if there's clinical deterioration, if there's respiratory muscle fatigue, if there's obtundation or comatose, if there's hypotension. Here with hypotension, I'll put a star on there because I'll come back in terms of complications. This is a very important concept I want you to understand when you're mechanically ventilating a patient and in terms of how it affects the BP. Then it could also be due to acute partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide greater than 50 millimeters of mercury with an arterial partial with the arterial pH rather less than 7.23 or indeed neuromuscular diseases. So remember that the mechanical ventilation itself is not going to cure the disease process so that has to be addressed and you should correct anything that can be corrected because you don't want to remove someone from a vent if you haven't corrected the underlying cause and of course the decision to make a patient uh, undergo mechanical ventilation actually must be thoroughly thought through because intubation and even a positive pressure ventilation comes with certain risks and complications which we'll talk about towards the end of this lecture. Then patients that are having increase in severity of illness, you should actually consider this patient uh, to be a candidate to start mechanical ventilation. Before I go into details of ventilation, I just want to 
get all the boring stuff out of the way. So I want us to talk about respiratory mechanics. There are certain types of pressures that I need you to understand that you may see on your ventilator, certain graphs you may see on the ventilator machine that will help you have a good understanding. So we'll look at what's known as peak airway pressure. We'll look at elastic pressure, resistive pressure, and expiratory pressure. The positive end expiratory pressure as well as the intrinsic uh, peep, which is also known as the auto peep. So we'll begin with the first thing. Remember that because the lungs are elastic, they are compliant to some extent, they are going to some extent resist airway moving through them. There's going to be some sort of resistance because the lungs have certain elasticity, they have certain things in their airways. So we can measure the peak airway pressure by um, actually measuring at the, at the airway opening and this is routinely done and it's displayed on the mechanical ventilators so it's just simply the amount of pressure the total amount of pressure that you need to push a certain volume of a gas through the lungs because remember that the lungs are composed of lung tissue composed of airways that have some sort of elasticity that have some sort of compliancy and these things are going to be affecting how much resistance is being offered so the pressure that is needed to push in this volume of air into the lungs is what we refer to as the peak airway pressure the higher the peak airway pressure the greater the risk of barotrauma so we shall see that with some modes of the ventilator where we can set the volume and then the pressure is varied by the machine we're going to see that if we have set a certain volume like for example 400 mils and in this patient they don't really have compliant lungs their lungs are stiff it means that the machine will generate even greater pressure so that you can force as much air as possible to reach the set volume that we have set in the machine so this can actually create a high peak airway pressure and this can cause barotrauma so the Peak airway pressure is going to be influenced by the inspiratory flow resistance, which we call the resistive pressure, the elastic recoil of the lungs and the chest wall, which is known as the elastic pressure, the alveolar pressure, which is present at the elastic recoil of the lungs and the chest, which is also part of the elastic pressure, as well as the alveolar pressure present at the beginning of the breath, which is known as the positive end expiratory pressure. So all these things are going to be influencing the peak airway pressure and how much total pressure that you are creating in the system to push a volume of air into the lungs. So here's a graph and what it looks like. So remember that the airway pressure here, PAW is known as the airway pressure. This is the abbreviation. And then the PIP here is the peak airway pressure. So remember that this is also known as the, the plateau pressure. So as you want to push in a certain amount of volume, remember there's some resistance that is going to be offered by the airways, resistance that's going to be offered by the chest, resistance that's going to be offered by the lungs. So it means that the pressures are going to increase up until they reach a certain point, which is known as the peak airway pressure, the maximum point and then eventually they will drop and plateau off and eventually decrease as this person is exhaling. So remember that some researchers have actually suggested that this plateau pressure actually is going to be, this plateau here is going to be, uh, should be measured as a means to actually prevent the barotrauma from happening, especially in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we can actually measure the uh, plateau pressure at the end of inspiratory phase and this is often done in these ventilators that are controlled by the volume or what we call cycle cycled tidal volume ventilators so the ventilator is programmed not to allow the expiratory uh, flow of air at the end of inspiration for a set time so it's typically about half a second before the patient is allowed to expire it will block the valve and you can actually measure the pressures at this time. So the pressure measured to maintain the lack of expiratory flow is what's referred to as a plateau pressure. So we actually minimize the barrel pressure uh, when the plateau pressure is actually maintained at less than 30 millimeters or rather 30 centimeters of water. So if we monitor the peak and the plateau pressure, it can actually allow us to make a good judgment on the progress of the patient. So keep this graph in mind. Mind. 
Then remember that an elevation of the peak airway pressure above 25 centimeters of water should actually prompt you to measure the end inspiratory pressure, in essence, the plateau pressure. So by actually end inspiratory hold maneuver to actually determine the relative contribution of the elastic as well as the resistive forces or resistive pressures. So the valve is going to close just after the, before the patient actually exhales the valve is actually going to close and it's going to close for about 0.3 to about 0.5 seconds after inspiration so it's going to delay exhalation so this time you can actually measure the pressure so during this time the airway pressure is going to be falling from its peak value and uh, because air is not going to be flowing the valves have been closed so the resulting end inspiratory pressure is actually going to be as a result of the elastic pressure and once we remove the positive end end uh, expiratory pressure then assuming that the patient actually is not making any active inspiration or expiration uh, at the time of you measuring this so the difference between the peak and the plateau is going to give you what is known as a resistive pressure so in terms of the resistive pressure or you can refer to this as the inspiratory flow resistance it's actually going to be produced by the circuit of resistance as well as the air flow so remember that in those patients that are mechanically ventilated the resistance to airflow actually occurs in the ventilator circuit it can occur in the endotracheal tube and most importantly it can occur in the patient's airways the tube can be blocked the patient can be chewing on the tube the tube can be kinked the airways can undergo spasms they can have secretions in them so these things are going to be offering some sort of resistance to the airflow so elevated resistive pressures that are greater than 10 centimeters of water actually are going to be suggesting that the endotracheal tube has been kinked or plugged with secretions or that there is an intraluminal mass or maybe there are bronchospasms that are present so you have to check for these things in terms of the elastic pressure remember this is the product of the elastic recoil of the lungs and the chest as well as the volume of the gas that is going to be delivered so remember that for a given volume the elastic pressure is going to be increased by increasing the lung stiffness so it means that in conditions like pulmonary fibrosis the elasticity has been reduced so it means that this elastic pressure must be much greater to pull these lungs apart and to stretch them back or to release when the, that pressure is released for them to get back or it's restricted by excursion of the chest or the diaphragm for example in patients with ascites or in patients with the massive obesity so remember that elastance is actually inversely proportional to compliancy so it means if there's high elasticity there's going to be low compliancy so increase in elastic pressure above 10 centimeters of water could suggest things like decrease in lung compliancy for example if there's edema fibrosis or low telectasis it could be due to large pleural effusions or a pneumothorax or even a fibro um, thorax it could be due to extra pulmonary restriction that can result from for example circumferential burns around the chest it could be other chest wall deformities ascites pregnancy even massive obesity remember that a tidal volume that's too large of an amount for the lung to be ventilated remember that a normal tidal volume being delivered to a single lung because maybe the endotracheal tube has just gone too further down the airway and is in one of the bronchi maybe in the right bronchi such that you're just delivering this tidal volume to the right side of the lungs then in terms of end expiratory pressure remember that this is the pressure in the alveoli that is normally the same as the atmospheric pressure so when the alveoli actually fail to empty completely because maybe there's an airway obstruction there's air limitation or these a shortened expiratory, uh, expiratory time or even end expiratory pressure then this end expiratory pressure may actually become positive relative to the atmosphere so if this end expiratory pressure now becomes positive greater than the atmospheric pressure then we refer to this as the intrinsic peep or what we call the auto peep so the reason why we're calling it auto peep because there is another type of pressure which is known as positive end expiratory pressure which is usually applied by the machine which we can actually set in the machine so to differentiate between these two we actually call this type of the end expiratory pressure that becomes positive relative to the atmosphere we refer to it as the auto peep so remember the difference between peep and auto peep it can be referred to as intrinsic peep it can be also called as auto peep
So remember that this auto peep can be measured in a passive patient through the end expiratory hold maneuver. So immediately before a breath, the expiratory port is actually closed for two seconds. Then the flow stops. So this eliminates any resistive pressure. Then the resulting pressure is going to be reflecting the amount of pressure in the alveoli at the end of expiration, or in short, the auto peep, or also known as the intrinsic peep. So the accurate measurement actually depends on the patient actually being completely passive on the ventilator so it's going to be unwarranted to uh, use of neuromuscular blockade solely for the purpose of actually measuring the intrinsic PEEP. So you may sometimes have a non-quantitative method of identifying the intrinsic PEEP. Uh, you can actually inspect the expiratory flow tracing. So remember, if the expiratory flow continues until the next breath uh, or the patient's chest fails to come to rest before the next breath, then you have to be cognizant or to be aware that there may be some auto PEEP or inspiratory PEEP. There may be some end expiratory pressure that is present greater than the atmospheric pressure. So remember that the, co the consequences of having this auto peep is that there's go it's going to increase the inspiratory work of breathing. It's going to decrease the venous return. This is very important because remember that is what is known as the thoracic pump. Remember in the thorax, the heart is also present right in the center. So as the volume increases and the pressures drop inside the thoracic cavity, the assumption is that venous return to the heart is going to increase. And remember, if you increase venous return, it means you're increasing the preload. If you increase the preload, it means you're increasing the cardiac output, the contractility of the heart. Now, in the case where this person still has some air that is trapped inside their airways and they have some pressures at the end of expiration that are greater than the atmospheric pressure, it means that the pressures in the thorax will also be much greater. So this is going to reduce the venous return. And if this has reduced the venous return, it's going to reduce the preload. It's going to reduce the cardiac output. It's further going to reduce the blood pressure. So this patient may be hypotensive. So if you have an intrinsic peep or an auto peep that is present, you should actually search for a cause for airway obstruction there. Maybe there's some secretions in the airway. Maybe there's decreased elastic recoil. Maybe there are bronchospasms. So a high minute ventilation greater than 20 liters per minute can also result in having an auto peep in a patient with no airflow obstruction. So be aware of that as well. So if the cause of the, of the airway um, or the intrinsic peep or rather, if the cause is airflow limitation of the intrinsic peep, then the intrinsic peep can actually be reduced by shortening the inspiratory time. So you can actually increase the inspiratory flow or you can reduce the expiratory or rather the respiratory rate. And so this can allow for a greater fraction of the respiratory cycle to be spent in exhalation as opposed to inspiration. Now, having gotten those or understood those respiratory mechanics, let's now go into a bit more further details in talking about the machines. So remember that the ventilators can either drive a certain volume of a gas into a patient or they can deliver this volume at a certain pressure, they can deliver it at a certain rate and they can deliver it at a certain oxygen concentration. You can change the volume on some machines, you can change the pressure on some machines, you can set the rate, you can set the amount of oxygen that is going to be delivered to the particular patient. Now, what, two important variables that you need to know in terms of these machines is pressure and volume. They are machines that are going to be pretty much control you can variate the volume and the pressure remains constant or you can variate the pressure and the volume remains constant or variate the volume and the pressure remains constant. What do I mean? So if you have a machine and you want to set the volume constant, then the machine will not allow you to variate the pressure because for a certain amount of volume, you have to actually uh, give a certain amount of pressure. So the, if you have set the volume, for example, to be constant at like, for example, 500 mils, it means that the pressure that has to be generated by this machine would depend on the circumstance that is there. For example, if the lungs are quite stiff, it means that to push in this 500 mils of air, you have to generate much greater pressure. If the lungs are very compliant, to push in this 500 mils of air, it means you have to generate less pressure. So if you set the volume as the constant, the pressure is often going to be decided by the machine. Same thing with the pressure. If the pressure is set as constant, then the machine is going to be varying the volume. For example, if you set the pressure to 10 millimeters of mercury, it means that 
with each breath, you're going to be offering 10 millimeters of mercury. So it means that if the lungs are very stiff, it means you're going to push in less air into those lungs because they are less compliant. You just want to maintain the pressures at 10 millimeters of mercury. If the lungs are very compliant, then it means that you're going to push in a lot of air into these lungs. So they are machines that are going to be controlled by volume, which we call the volume cycled ventilators. These are going to be delivering a constant amount of volume that you as the physician are going to be setting and the pressure is going to vary in these machines. Then there are machines that are pressure cycled, which are going to be delivering a constant pressure, while it's you, you are the one who's going to be setting that pressure, while it's the machine is going to variate the amount of volume that's going to be pushed into the patient. There are those machines that can variate both the volume and pressure, then there are those that are dependent on the time which you can preset. But most of the machines and most of the things that we often control have to do with the volume and not the pressure. So in most of the cases, even in your ICU, it's going to be dealing with pretty much controlling the volume. So the volume cycled machine are the ones that are going to be very common. And these ones are going to be setting a, a set preset amount of a tidal volume that you want to be delivered to the patient and this tidal volume is going to be varied or rather the pressure is going to be varied in this machine so that you can deliver this amount of volume into the patient. Then in terms of the pressure cycle do we keep the pressure constant and then the tidal volume is on that's going to be variating and remember that the changes in the respiratory system mechanics can actually result in unrecognized changes in the alveolar ventilation. So because the the because of these pressure cycled machines there is often some limits to the use of them because the distending pressures of because of the distending pressures of the lungs so remember that they are certain pathologies that may actually worsen when we deliver higher pressures or higher volumes of air inside the lungs now there are some different modes that you can use on the vents, there's something that's known as controlled mandatory ventilation mode or CMV. There's something that's known as assist control mode. There's synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation and there's spontaneous breathing mode. So the first two, the controlled mandatory as well as assist control, those are the ones that you would often like to start whenever you are putting a patient on the vent. The only difference is this, with the controlled, the machine is controlling everything. With assisted, the machine is controlling parts of it, but it's largely triggered by the patient. Then in terms of the synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation as well as the spontaneous breathing, these are often going to be partly also controlled by the triggered by the patient and the machine is just going to be more or less in the background. So the controlled mandatory ventilation, the assist control modes as well as the SIMV are going to be volume cycled ventilation modes. So often we start patients on either the CMV mode or the AC mode. Then we also have some pressure cycled modes like the pressure control ventilation, the pressure support ventilation which we often use to wean off patients. The synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation as well as the pressure support is often used to wean off patients from the ventilator. Then you have some non-invasive modes that's pretty much your CPAP and your BiPAP, but I'll talk about that in a different lecture. So the modes that you actually choose to start the patient on are going to depend on certain things. They'll depend on how much you want to optimize the ventilation to perfusion mismatch. The pressure volume relationship in the lungs of the patient and other things as the, the patient uh, ventilator synchrony as well as the comfort of the patient. These are going to be important factors about talking about each of these modes. We will discuss each of these modes in greater details very shortly but for now I want to tell you about how we start off these ventilator. How do we put a patient initially on a ventilator? You have made a decision that okay Let's put this patient on a ventilator. So keep in mind that of all these modes, if they have the word control in them, keep in mind that the majority of the work is going to be done by the ventilator. It's not going to be done by the patient. So the majority of the work is done by the ventilator. So how do we start putting this patient on a vent? So remember that the ventilator settings are going to be tailored based on the condition. So after you have decided that this patient needs a vent, a positive uh, ventilation, remember you're going to be 
pretty much using a volume cycled setting, a volume cycled mode. And once you now select the mode that you're going to be choosing, then you have some settings that you're going to be entering in. So in most of the circumstances, the mode of ventilation that you either start off with is either your assisted control ventilation. That's assuming if the patient is able to take breaths. If the patient is able to take a breath, you can start them on the assist control mode because the patient has to trigger the machine, then the machine is going to assist the, the breathing. Then if they are not taking spontaneous breaths or if they are too weak to actually even trigger the machine, you can put them on the controlled mandatory ventilation where regardless of whether the patient is triggering the breaths or not, the machine is going to be giving a fixed volume of air at a fixed rate, a fixed minimum rate. So in some of these modes, you can actually adjust certain settings like the respiratory rate, the tidal volume, the trigger sensitivity, the flow rate, the waveform, even the inspiratory expiratory ratio. You can also um, set the rate, the tidal volume, the fraction of inspired oxygen, the peak end expiratory pressure or the PEEP. You can set these things in some of these modes. So just a little bit about the control, uh, assist control mode, like I told you, first of all, you can change the frequency or the rate, you can change the timings of the breaths, you can set the volume. Here the patient has to have some inspiratory effort. So as long as your patient is not breathing, they don't have intrinsic trigger to breathe or any stimulant to breathe. Don't put them on this mode because they'll die. Of course, there may be some backup rate that is there in case the patient is not breathing. But often if the patient is not breathing, it would be better to put them on the controlled mandatory mode because regardless of whatever is happening, the machine will still keep pushing in air at a certain volume, at a certain rate in the controlled mandatory Vo uh, mo controlled mandatory ventilation mode. But in terms of the assist control, the patient has to trigger this. So the ventilator is going to be sensing this. Remember that the patient is intubated and the it's connected to a tube that is tightly fit and uh, assuming that there's no leak in your system, when the patient breathes in, they are going to create a negative pressure inside the tubing. And according to the sensitivity that you have set your machine at, if it detects this negative pressure, it's going to be triggered and to force air now at a certain volume that you have set to move into the patient. So in this way, the patient can actually dictate a comfortable respiratory rate and may actually trigger the machine to assist the breaths above a, a set rate. Then if the patient actually doesn't initiate a respiration, then the ventilator is automatically going to deliver that preset rate and the tidal volume. So this is the backup rate I was telling you about and so that you can have this minimum um, minute ventilation. So in this mode, the work of breathing is actually reduced to the amount of inspiration needed to trigger the machine, but this has some drawbacks. Because if the person is triggering the machine quite a number of times, it means that this person is going to have a very high respiratory rate. And remember, every time you're exhaling, you're breathing out carbon dioxide. So you'll lose a lot of carbon dioxide in their body, and this will cause their pH to rise. So this is often associated with respiratory alkalosis. So the first setting that we're going to be, so the first mode that we're going to be choosing is either between the controlled mandatory ventilation or the assist control mode. So I've chosen, for example, let's say I've chosen the assist control mode for this particular patient that we have taken to the ICU has already been intubated. The next thing that you're going to be checking is the rate and the tidal volume. So remember that tidal volume is pretty much the amount of air that can be exchanged between the atmosphere as well as the lungs at rest. So the tidal volume and the respiratory rate are going to be greatly affecting what is known as the minute ventilation. So the respiratory rate is going to be set. Remember, some of the machines will show you F instead of RR. F is just simply standing for frequency. They mean the same thing as respiratory rate. So you're going to be setting it between 12 to 20. There are some times where you can even go as far as 30 breaths per minute. So we usually use a lower setting of 12 to 14 breaths per minute for cases like obstruction and even things like asthma. And for those that have acute respiratory distress syndrome as well as pneumonias, we want to use a higher setting of 18 to 20 breaths per minute. But remember, like I said, with the hyperventilation, you wash out that carbon dioxide, you cause a respiratory alkalosis and... This may also be 
um, seen with inadequate expiratory time even in patients with auto peep or the intrinsic peep that I talked about. And if you have a too low rate, it means you're going to retain most of that carbon dioxide. And once that carbon dioxide has been retained, it will cause this respiratory acidosis. So the decision to set the rate actually must depend on the clinical condition of the patient and the first ABGs that you're going to be doing for the patient. In terms of the tidal volume, remember, this tidal volume is going to be calculated based on the ideal body weight. So we don't just calculate it based on the body weight of the patient, the actual weight of the patient. No, because ideal body weight is different from the body weight of the patient. So the normal, we usually start off at about 6 to 8 mils per kg of the ideal body weight. And how do we find this ideal body weight? So for men, we say 50 kg plus 2.3 in brackets, the height in inches, not in centimeters or meters, in inches, minus 60. Then for the women, it's 45.5 kg plus 2.3, the height in inches, minus 60. Remember, if we give a high tidal volume, this has a risk of overinflation, and it can actually cause the alveoli to burst. And remember that if we increase the pressures inside the chest, the venous return is also going to be much less to the heart. Cardiac output will be less. There is a high risk of hypotension in this patient. And then if we give a two low of a tidal volume, the lungs will collapse. So there'll be sections of a telectasis in the lungs. So a low tidal volume of about six to eight mils per kg is for ideal body weight is actually good if we're dealing with patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. But if you have these low levels of the tidal volumes, then these patients with um, um, we can use this also in patients that have a normal lung. We can use this also in patients that are undergoing surgery, those that are under general anesthesia. So usually a, a safe way to start is about eight to six to eight mils per kg. But in other pathologies, for example, those that have trauma, those that are obtundation, those that have severe acidosis, you want to start at slightly higher tidal volumes, for example, eight to 10 mils per kg ideal body weight. Then for those patients that have pre-existing disease, the tidal volume is going to be set by what is known as the 12-12 rule. So you're going to be starting off at 12 mils per kg ideal body weight at a frequency of 12 breaths per minute. So this is going to be in the assist control mode. Then for the patients with COPDs, we use what is known as the 10-10 rule. So this is done because you want to prevent any overinflation, want to prevent that auto positive and expiratory pressure. That's the auto peep. Want to prevent the airway pressures in the lungs after expiration to remain positive greater than the atmosphere. So to prevent this, we use the 10-10 rule. So we get, we say 10 mils per kg ideal body weight to de to be delivered 10 times or at a frequency of 10 times per minute or 10 breaths per minute. So in the patients with acute respiratory distress and the lung function may actually be best and volume trauma is actually minimized if we use lower volumes of 6 to 8 mils per kg. So this ventilator strategy is what we refer to as the lung protective ventilation. So we use lower volumes of air. But remember, with these lower volumes of air, it means that we're going to be trapping a lot of carbon dioxide in the body. So to circumvert this carbon dioxide in the body, sometimes we may increase the frequency. But as long as the carbon dioxide doesn't cause a significant drop in the pH, we can actually leave it. We call this as permissive um, hypercapnia. We can actually leave it as, as long as it doesn't drop below 7.25, it's not so much of a big deal. The next setting that we put in is a fraction of inspired oxygen. Remember that air is a mixture of gases and oxygen is going to be accounting for about 21% of the uh, gases. So you may sometimes deliver greater concentrations of oxygen to the patient. Now this may seem like a good thing. So remember that when you get too much oxygen, too much of everything is bad. If it's too much of this learning thing is bad. Anyways, I'm just joking to actually keep you concentrated. So higher levels of oxygen will mean that there's a greater chance of oxygen free radicals actually forming and they can actually cause injury. So you don't want to keep this patient at a high level of fraction of inspired oxygen. So it can range from 21% up until you reach 100%, which is just like pure oxygen, 100% pure oxygen. So often we're going to start high, then we'll reduce. The reason why we do this 
is because we don't know what happened during intubation. We don't know if there was some hypoxia that was sustained, any damage due to low oxygen partial pressures that were sustained. So that's why we often start high as opposed to starting low. Because if we start low and this patient already had some sort of hypoxia, they'll keep getting worse. So the highest priority at the start of the mechanical ventilation is providing effective oxygenation. So for patients that have been intubated, the fraction of inspired oxygen is often set to 100% until we can document an arterial oxygen uh, concentration that is adequate, then we can actually decrease it to the lowest level necessary to maintain the adequate oxygenation, to maintain your oxygen partial pressures at least above 94% but some books actually use 92%. So you may sometimes have some impaired oxygenation. So some literature actually say we can start off at 80 to 90, but I'd advise you to start off as high as possible, probably 100%. Because remember that a short period of you exposing a patient to 100% oxygen is not really so dangerous because the patient can still receive it during mechanical ventilation and it actually offers some clinical advantages. So we first are going to start off at 100% to protect them from hypoxia that you may have not recognized that's happened during intubation. And then afterwards, we're going to be measuring the uh, partial pressure of oxygen. Then we can now begin to taper off the, the fraction of inspired oxygen. So we can actually use the partial arterial partial pressure of oxygen together with the fraction of inspired oxygen to actually calculate what is known as the shunt fraction. Remember what I told you earlier on in this lecture, I say that if the lungs are going to be exposed to a lot of oxygen, it will cause the constriction of the pulmonary vessels. So it may actually cause shunting of blood in the pulmonary system. So we can actually calculate the shunting fraction and this shunting fraction will be very important because it will now enable us to be able to start or to increase the, the peak expiratory uh, pressure the PEEP in this patient if we reach a certain point of the shunt fraction. So what do I mean? How do I find this? So the shunt fraction is going to be the degree, rather 700 millimeters of mercury minus the measured arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So for each difference of 100 millimeters of mercury, the shunt is about 5%. And if your shunt is 25% or more, it means you must add a PEEP to your settings, increase the PEEP to a certain amount. We'll talk about PEEP very shortly. So remember that inadequate oxygenation despite the administration of 100% oxygen means that you should look for another cause. So it could be that the endotracheal intubation is gone into the right uh, main stem uh, bronchi or maybe there's positive pressure breathing, there's a pneumothorax that you have missed. So if such complications are not present then the PEEP actually can be added uh, to prevent the intrapulmonary shunting. And then because there are only a few disease processes that can create intrapulmonary shunting, so a clinically significant estimated shunt uh, should actually narrow the potential source of hypoxia to one of the following conditions. Maybe it's the alveolar collapse. Maybe there's a major atelectasis. Maybe the alveoli are filling with something other than gas. Maybe it's a loba pneumonia. Maybe there's water or protein in terms of the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Maybe it's congestion in terms of water, which is coming from congestive heart failure. Maybe it's blood in terms of a hemorrhage. Then... We can actually apply the PEEP in any of the ventilator modes. Remember that at the end of expiration, we want to keep the airways open so that they don't collapse. Think of it like this. It's easier to inflate a balloon that already has some sort of air in it. So this one here is actually a mode of therapy used in conjunction with different modes of mechanical ventilation. It's often kept at low limits that's at about four to five centimeters of water. And remember, it is the pressure that's going to be exerted at the end of expiration, and it's meant to keep the alveolar open and to prevent them from collapsing to reduce the work of breathing, such that it makes the next breath easier to initiate. So remember that at the end of mechanical spontaneous expiration, the PEEP actually is going to be maintaining the airway pressure above atmospheric pressure. And this is going to be exerting a, a type of pressure that opposes the passive emptying of the lungs. So remember that most patients that are undergoing mechanical ventilation may actually benefit from a PEEP, which is often set about five centimeters of water. And this limits the lungs from collapsing. And this can, um, the, then this collapsing can be caused by things like endotracheal intubation, um, sedation, paralysis, or even the supine position.
So the higher levels of PEEP, um, as high as 14 centimeters, can actually improve oxygenation in disorders such as cardiogenic pulmonary edema, even acute respiratory distress, because they're going to keep the alveoli open. This is quite similar to what we do in CPAP, where there's this constant pressure that is applied to the airway to keep them open. It's also quite important, especially in patients with these same conditions. Then lower levels of PEEP actually are used in pneumothorax because already there's a high uh, pressure inside the thorax. So if you increase even the PEEP even higher, it means that you're going to reduce the venous return. So the PEEP actually is going to permit you to use lower levels of fraction of inspired oxygen because most of the airway will remain open. And this actually is also going to uh, preserve the adequate arterial oxygenation. And this effect is actually very important in limiting the injury that's going to be caused by having this patient being on high levels of uh, oxygen concentration for a very long period of time, typically those that are greater than 60%. So remember that again, if the PEEP is increased, then it's going to increase the intrathoracic pressure. And if it's too high, it may actually reduce the venous return. It may cause hypotension, especially in patients that are already hypovolemic. And remember, this is going to reduce the left ventricular afterload. It's going to reduce the cardiac output. It may actually even cause distension of different portions of the lungs, what we call ventilator-associated lung injury or valley. So if the PEEP is too low, then the uh, cyclic air spaces opening and closing can, because they are collapsing and then they're being inflated again, this can create these shearing forces. Um, and these shearing forces can actually cause or also contribute to the ventilator associated lung injury. So the variation means that for a given PEEP, there's increase in volume that will be lower uh, for dependent areas compared to the non-dependent regions of the lungs. Another thing that we set is the sensitivity, which is going to be this the, this negative pressure that has to be created in order for the vent actually to be stimulated. So typically, it's going to be less than two centimeters of water. So if it's if you have a too high of a setting, meaning that it's more negative, for example, if you set it at minus four or minus five, it means that those patients that are too weak are not going to be able to trigger the breath. If you set it too low, for example, minus one, then it may lead to over ventilation and it may cause the machine to actually auto cycle. So the patients with high levels of auto peep, those with COPDs, those with asthma because of the airway trapping, then there may be some difficulty in inhaling deeply enough to actually achieve a sufficient negative intra airway pressure to stimulate the machine. The other thing that you can set in other modes is the inspiratory expiratory ratio, because remember that Inspiration and expiration often have certain times. You take longer in expiring than you do in inspiring. So this ratio is going to be helping you adjust the different lengths of inspiration and expiration. And this may actually help in limiting the amount of air that remains in the lungs because the longer, um, because there are some ratios that can allow you to remain in expiration a bit longer than inspiration. So generally the normal ratio is one to three. And then in patients with asthma or exacerbation of COPDs, you can actually set ratios of one to four. Then in terms of the inspiratory flow rate, so you can either set one of the two things. You can either set the inspiratory expiratory ratio or you can set the inspiratory flow rate. So you can't adjust both at the same time. So the inspiratory flow rate is generally going to be set at around 60 liters per minute, but it can be increased to up to 120 liters per minute, especially for patients with airflow limitation to facilitate them having more time in exhalation, like I already told you, to prevent the auto peep. Then you remember some machines also do have size. So every time a patient breathes, spontaneously they may typically sigh about six to eight times each hour to prevent this micro collapse in the lungs so some investigators actually once recommended that periodic machine um, breaths that were one to 1.5 to about two times the present tidal volume be given at about six to eight times per hour so currently the peak pressure often needed to actually deliver such volumes with high enough 
uh, actually was high enough to predispose this patient to barrel trauma. So at present, we actually don't account for the size if the patient is actually receiving tidal volumes at 10 to 12 mils per kg, or if the patient actually requires a PEEP, there's no need to actually account for the size. Then when a low tidal volume is used, actually the size are present at about 1.5 to 2 times the tidal volume and delivered at 6 to 8 times an hour if the peak and the plateau pressures are within the acceptable limits. So what are the summary of how we're going to set up this ventilator? So the first mode that we're going to be choosing is assisted control mode which is often going to be triggered by the patient, or sometimes you can use the controlled mandatory ventilatory mode. So the tidal volume is going to be set for a normal patient, 12 mils per kg, uh, the 12-12, so 12 mils per kg at 12 uh, breaths per minute. Then for the COPD, 10 mils uh, per kg ideal body weight at 10 breaths per minute. Then those with ARDS, 6 to 8 mils per kg ideal body weight. The rate is often set at 10 to 12 breaths per minute. Fraction of inspired oxygen at around 100%. The size are rarely needed. Then the peak respiratory flow rate is only indicated if you have the first arterial blood gas determining that there's a shunting that's greater than 25%. That's your 700 minus your arterial partial pressure. Then... 5% for the difference above 100 millimeters of mercury. Then inadequate oxygenation with uh, FiO2 less than 60%. So this is what we're going to be. These are the settings that we're going to be inputting into the machine and we're going to be assessing this patient. We're going to be assessing the arterial blood gases. You're going to be assessing the pulse oximetry, the blood pressure and the clinical status of the patient. Now I want to go into the different types of modes of the ventilators so that you can understand what each mode does and how each mode works. I know this has been a very long lecture. If you're enjoying this lecture, just post your favorite part or if you now understand about mechanical ventilation in the comment section below. So the first mode is known as the controlled mandatory ventilation mode. So here all the breaths are going to be provided by the ventilator. There is no spontaneous breathing or effort from the patient. So here you, you are going to be setting the volume, you're going to be setting the rate. So this mode is quite suitable for patients that are sedated, those that are paralyzed, those that are comatose, and those that cannot breathe on their own. So this one here, because the muscles are not working, they can atrophy if the patient is on the vent for a very long time. It can cause barrel trauma, because remember that the pressure is going to be varied. This one here is a volume controlled method. So the pressure is going to vary and sometimes if the lungs are stiff it means you're going to deliver higher pressures. So you can even sometimes get a warning that there is a high peak pressure or sometimes if the tube is bent or it's blocked by secretions you may get an alarm on your machine that there's a high peak pressure because there is some airflow resistance. Then sometimes if you disconnect the machine accidentally your power goes your patients are going to die if they're not mechanically ventilated or rather um, manually ventilated. So here's a diagram to show you. So as you can see, each of the breaths are going to be triggered by the machine where the pressures are going to increase to a certain amount and then they're going to fall. There's air that's going to be pushed in and then is eventually going to be exhaled and air is going to be flowing through as the volume is also increasing. So this is the controlled mode. So the patient receives only the breaths that are initiated by the ventilator at a preset rate. Then the next mode is known as the assist control, which I talked about in details earlier on here. The patient has some breathing effort. The healthcare personnel is going to be setting the constant volume. You're also going to set up a backup rate in case your patient is not breathing. Then each time your patient actually tries to take a breath, they'll create this negative pressure, and then this will trigger the machine now to uh, facilitate or to help with the breath. So it's going to deliver an amount of air when the patient actually wants to breathe. So if the patient is hypoventilating or having this minimal breathing, then you can actually set up a backup rate, for example, 12 breaths per minute, so as that you still maintain a minimum ventilation in this patient, the minimum minute ventilation in this patient. The disadvantage of this is if your patient is triggering the machine very much, it will cause respiratory alkalosis because they are breathing in and out. So most commonly, this is actually going to be happening in patients where the respiratory drive actually is going to be superseding the chemoreceptors and the mechanoreceptors that are controlling respiration. So it could be in 
con in patients that have conditions like end stage liver disease, in patients that are in the hyperventilatory hyperventilatory state of sepsis, and even in patients with head trauma, they may actually develop this respiratory alkalosis. So these conditions are going to be typically identified when you do your first ABG, and the assist control ventilation can actually be changed to a different mode. Then. Serial uh, preset positive pressure breaths can actually affect the venous return, like I told you, to the right side of the heart. It can also affect the global uh, cardiac output. So regardless, this is actually one of the safest modes to start the patient on for mechanical ventilation. And if the patient is still hypotensive or hypocapnic, then we can actually change them to another different types of mode. So in this mode, the volume or pressure control can actually be set but most of the times we set the volume so again here is a patient is beginning to take a breath there's a negative pressure that is created so then this now generates the machine to now create this artificial or to pump pushing this air and there's uh, this flow of air into the patient Remember that the work of breathing is not completely eliminated in this mode. So the mode actually is going to be giving the respiratory muscles the greatest amount of rest because the patient needs only to create enough negative pressure to actually trigger the machine. So another advantage of this mode is that the cycling, um, the ventilator into the inspiratory phase actually maintains a normal ventilatory activity and there is no atrophy of the muscles because the muscles are still working to some extent to initiate that inspiration. Another advantage is that the patient can actually achieve the required minute ventilation by uh, setting up a backup rate in case the patient actually does not initiate the breath. So like I said, in some cases, the in, especially in terms of the volume controlled assisted uh, ventilation, you may sometimes have high pressures that are generated. Remember that you have set a particular volume. The thing that the machine is going to vary is the pressure. So there are some times where you can actually vary the pressure and the pressure may sometimes be too high. The total amount of pressure that is needed to push in this volume of air into the lungs may be too high, something that we call as a high peak uh, pressure. So you may set up a high peak pressure alarm. So if you see this alarm, you want to check and assess starting from the machine going to the patient. So you want to check if there's any water secretions, any blockage of the tubes or the vent. And some patients may actually be chewing on the endotracheal tube. You want to check if there's any blocking or kinking of the endotracheal tube. You want to ensure that there are no spasms or secretions. If they're there, you sort, sort those things out. So remember that after a tidal volume is selected, the peak airway pressure is going to be necessary to deliver a single breath and this is going to be actually as this tidal volume is actually being pushed in then there's a pressure that's going to be required to force all this air into the lungs so persistent peak pressures that are greater than 45 centimeters of water are a risk of barotrauma and remember we are going to be using the 12-12 rule and the 10-10 rule to actually decrease this from happening and to keep the pressures less than 45 centimeters of water so here's again um, a graph so in part a here these uh, the effects of decreasing the respiratory compliancy then as you can see here this is what's happening in the normal patient and then if we decrease the compliancy this is what the graph will actually look like and then if there is increase in airway resistance this is what's happening in this graph here as you can see you generate even higher peak inspiratory pressures over time the next mode of the ventilator is known as the synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. It's very good for weaning off the patients. So here, this one is going to be delivering the breaths at a set rate and volume that is synchronized to the patient's efforts. So it's a, a mode that's often used for weaning off the patients, though it's not really a good mode to use to wean off the patient. So here, the remember that in the assist control ventilation, the patient... The patient's efforts are the ones that were triggering the machine. So here you're going to set a specific respiratory rate. That's not going to be triggered by the patient, but it's going to be synchronized with the patient. It's going to be given at regular intervals in addition to the patient's breaths that they are taking. So this mode actually remains popular despite most of the studies actually indicating that it doesn't provide 
full ventilatory support as does with the assist control ventilation and it doesn't actually even facilitate weaning off the patient from the ventilator it doesn't improve the comfort of the patient so the rate and the volume are going to be set and the ventilator will actually check if the patient is breathing or not even if the patient actually triggers the breath the ventilator is not going to give any breaths so it's going to be given the breaths according to what you have set the rate and the volume the other type of mode is known as the pressure control ventilation so here there is a constant pressure that is set and the volume actually is going to be decided by the ventilator so each inspiratory effort beyond the set sensitivity threshold actually delivers full pressure support to maintain a fixed inspiratory time and then there's um this is going to be used in acute respiratory distress because you if a constant volume is actually used to inflate the lungs then it may actually generate higher pressures and these higher pressures can cause barotrauma so instead you want to keep the pressure constant and variate the volume the drawback of this is that sometimes secretions bronchospasms and kinking of the tube can result in lower tidal volumes because there is greater resistance and low air is going to be pushed into these lungs and then this is going to mean that there's going to be carbon dioxide retention and a lot of respiratory alkalosis. So in, in the patient that is on this mode, we often want to keep an eye on the expired tidal volume when you place this patient on this mode. Then the other mode is a pressure support or the spontaneous mode. This one is good for weaning patients off especially those that have been on a mechanical vent. So you want to set a minimum rate. Actually, a minimum rate is not set for the patient, so all the breaths are going to be triggered by the patient. Here, the machine is just simply going to support each breath with some amount of pressure, kind of like a sporter in the gym. Yeah, they're not going to be lifting the weights for you, but they're just going to be helping. In case you fail to lift, lift those weights, they'll come in and help you lift the weights. Then... The ventilator just assists the patient by delivering a certain pressure and it continues at a constant level. So if you actually just have pressure support, it's more or less like a CPAP, then this is going to be, um, of course, there's going to be an algorithm. There's going to be this pressure that's going to be given constantly until the patient's respiratory flow actually falls below the preset level that's going to be determined by your algorithm. Then... Uh, a longer and deeper inspiratory effort by the patient is going to be resulting in a larger tidal volume. So the trigger is by the patient and all the efforts of breathing are by the patient. The ventilator just provides this uh, pressure. So often it's used after patients have been placed in the spontaneous intermittent uh, ventilation mode and they're going to be put on pressure support to wean off the patient. Sometimes it may combine the SIMV together with the pressure support. And... It's a common method used to liberate or to wean patients off mechanical ventilation because we're letting them now to assume all the work of breathing and getting them ready to be off the vent. So uh, there are no studies though that indicate that this approach is actually more successful than the others in discontinuing the ventilation. So the pressure support typically is going to be starting from 5 to 15 centimeters of water for spontaneous breaths that are taken by the patient at above the set rate then the uh, pressure support can be adjusted as needed to maintain the certain minute ventilation so here's a comparison between the three main modes with the controlled mandatory ventilation the ventilator controls the breathing no patient triggers in terms of the assisted control ventilation the patient triggers the breathing and the ventilator just supports each breath in the synchronized intermittent mechanical ventilation the patient triggers the breath and the ventilator actually supports a few of the breaths then other considerations you may want to place the patient in a prone position and this is often used in a patient that has ARDS, severe hypoxia, and it can actually improve the functional residual capacity and postural drainage of secretions and ventilation perfusion mismatch can be corrected. So moving the intubated patient actually from the supine position to the prone position actually is going to require requiring coordination between the nursing staff, the respiratory therapist, the physicians, and this is because you want to prevent you from inadvertently extubating the patient or actually losing various lines or tubes on the patient. So the prone position may actually improve oxygenation in greater than 50% of such patients, but there are no survival benefits that have been documented according to the studies. Most of the patients that are actually receiving mechanical ventilation need some sort of sedation. 
by a continuous infusion or scheduled doses of certain drugs that can help with anxiety, with psychological stress that is inherent with the intervention of mechanical ventilation. So sometimes it may give them what we call sedation holidays when the you can clinically allow this then you decrease the number of days for mechanical ventilation and these sedation holidays can actually help the patient actually be reoriented faster and it can prevent unintended prolonged um, effects of the sedation and can keep the patient shorter when they are on the vent so the interruption of this sedation also aids in assessing whether the patient is ready to be weaned off and can actually quicken the transition to spontaneous respiration. It's actually important to avoid over sedation because it's going to decrease the ventilator free days and it's going to increase the ICU length of your patients. We may sometimes make some adjustments to the PEEP. So remember that a PEEP that is less than 10 centimeters of water, there's no need to make to worry about hemodynamic instability unless if the patient has some sort of intravascular volume depletion. So the cardiodepressant effects of the PEEP are often going to be minimized by judiciously giving this patient IV uh, fluids as well as uh, cardio cardiac inotropic support. Some of these inotropes can be used. So the peak pressure is going to be related to the development of barotrauma, arterial hypotension. It's going to be related to the mean airway pressure that's going to be decreasing the venous return to the heart. I've already explained this and it's going to decrease the ventricular uh, right ventricular function. So a PEEP that's greater than 10 centimeters generally is an indication for you to actually put this patient on a cardiac monitor using a Swan-Gans catheter. Then if the patient actually remains clinically stable with an adequate urine output, then hemodynamic monitoring actually may not be needed. So when the PEEP is actually greater than 10 centimeters of water, then the left atrial filling pressure can actually be estimated after an adjustment is made for the effect of the PEEP on the transducer of the catheter. So an equation that's used is known as the uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure minus the PEEP divided by three. So the left arterial pressure can be calculated using the same formula. So when you withdraw the PEEP from the patient, um, you shouldn't actually do this in most clinical setups until the patient actually is able to oxygenate and the fraction of inspired oxygen is 40% or less, then you can begin to withdraw the PEEP. So formal weaning off the PEEP actually is going to be undertaken by reducing the PEEP by about three to five centimeters of water decrements while lest we monitor the oxygen saturation by your pulse oximetry. And an unacceptable decrease in the level of the oxygen saturation, meaning that you have to put them back on the previous level where they had adequate amount of oxygen saturation. Now, what about liberation of patients from ventilation. Remember that we don't want to keep a patient longer on the vent than they are supposed to be. So unnecessary delays in the withdrawal of mechanical support actually increases the risk of this patient developing complications. It increases the risk of them staying in the ICU for longer. And remember, you staying at the hospital is already an added expense. But if we remove the patient too quickly from the vent, this also causes disastrous effects. So weaning actually should be considered when the patient has been assessed and we can assess that they can survive without this vent. So the patient should be evaluated each and every single day to determine if they're a candidate to be weaned off the vent. So there are certain questions that you should ask yourself before you wean your patient off the vent. Number one, is this process responsible for the patient's respiratory failure resolving or has it improved? Number two, is the patient hemodynamically stable? Is the patient free of any uh, active cardiac ischemia or any unstable arrhythmias or are they completely off the vessel uh, pressure support or is minimal uh, concentrations that are being used? Number three, is the oxygenation adequate with a partial arterial partial pressure of oxygen greater than 60 millimeters of mercury and they are on a fraction of inspired oxygen less than 40% and the PEEP is less than 5 centimeters? Are they mentally or neuromuscular status appropriate for the patient or there's no minimal sedation that is required? Number five, does the patient actually have adequate strength for, of the respiratory muscles? Number six, is the acid base status and electrolyte status optimized? Number seven, is the patient a febrile? Number eight, is the patient's adrenal and thyroid functions adequate to allow them to be weaned off? If all your answers to these questions are yes, then you can actually begin to wean your patient off. So there are numerous weaning parameters that can actually help you predict the 
success of extubation. However, there is no protocol that is 100% that's going to be accurate and say that this is going to be a successful extubation. There are some times that patients are fit the same criteria and have answered all those questions. You extubate them and they deteriorate and you have to re-intubate them and put them back on the vent. But some parameters that we often use include the respiratory rate less than 25 breaths per minute, tidal volume greater than 5 mils per kg, ideal body weight, a vital capacity greater than 10 mils per kg, a minute ventilation less than 10 liters per minute, uh, a ratio of partial pressure of arterial oxygen divided by fraction of inspired oxygen greater than 200, a shunt less than 20%, a negative respiratory force less than uh, minus 25 centimeters of water and a frequency divided by tidal volume ratio less than 105 or less than 130 in elderly patients. So additionally, it has been reported that these intercostal re retractions after adding dead space may actually help in detecting the susceptibility of extubation failure. How exactly do we wean the patient off? So remember that weaning from the mechanical ventilation is actually intended so that you can shift all the work of breathing from the machine to the patient. And the an issue separate from actually you disconnecting the patient from the ventilator is actually determining if the patient can maintain his or her um, airway and they can be extubated safely. And remember that the weaning process must ensure that the patient is um, the patient's safety is actually guarded because if you delay, then there's an increased risk of complications like ventilator-associated pneumonia. There are three approaches or three modes that we often use to win the patients off. There's what's known as a synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, the pressure support ventilation, and the spontaneous breathing trial. So the flow is often... Remember, patients will be started off either on the controlled mandatory ventilation and then they'll be switched to assist control. If they're having spontaneously uh, breathing, then we'll switch them to the synchronized intermittent uh, mandatory ventilation and then often we'll put them on a spontaneous mode or we disconnect them from the vent. At this point, the sedation should be lifted, give them some sedation holidays, and the patient is going to be placed on these spontaneous modes. We should ensure that the mental state is okay, there are no secretions, the ABGs must be done, partial pressure of uh, the carbon dioxide must be less than 45, arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide, arterial partial pressure of oxygen between 60 to 80, and a pH less than 7.35. So... If we are using the SIMV mode, remember that the breaths are either a mandatory ventilator controlled breath or a spontaneous breath with or without pressure support. We may sometimes add pressure support, we may sometimes not add pressure, pressure support. So remember that the intent of this is to actually let the patient's respiratory muscles rest during those mandatory breaths. Because remember at regular intervals, the machine is going to give you certain types of um, certain amount of air, certain breaths, certain volume of air. So the weaning is going to be accomplished by actually decreasing the number of mandatory breaths that the machine is going to be offering and then gradually increasing the workload of the respiratory muscles. So weaning is typically done by two breaths every one to two hours. You decrease by two breaths. So if you had 16 breaths per minute, in about one to two hours, you decrease to 14 of those mandatory breaths that are often provided by the machine. So the patient's heart rate, the respiratory rate, the oxygen saturation, um, actually indicate the ability of the patient to accomplish the work of breathing. So again, here is the SIMV, which is triggered by your volume here, the different graphs. So as you can see, these breaths here are like the ones that are provided by the machine. And here the patient is trying to breathe. So evidence actually now suggests that the respiratory muscles actually are not at rest when the mandatory breaths are being given and this mode actually can result in muscle fatigue and it can actually prolong mechanical ventilation. So contrary to most belief that this one here is used for uh, getting the patients off the vent, most of the recent research actually disproves this. So findings actually from this randomized trial suggest that SIMV weaning actually delays extubation compared to the pressure support ventilation and compared to the spontaneous breathing trial and it should actually not be used as a primary mode of weaning most patients off. Though in most of our facilities, we often use this mode. So the SIMV weaning does not ensure that the patient receives some ventilatory support, and it may be in favor, uh, it may be favored in some institutions where the staffing levels of respiratory therapists is actually not optimal, which is why we're still using it in most of our cases. And in terms of the pressure, of pressure support ventilation, remember all the breaths are supported 
and they are spon they're spontaneous. They're going to be caused by the patient and is combined with enough pressure to support and ensure that each breath actually creates a reasonable uh, tidal volume. So the pressure support actually lowers the work of breathing for the patient and is uh, weaning is actually performed gradually by decreasing the amount of pressure support and by transferring um, an increased proportion of work of breathing to the patient. So the transfer is actually continued until the pressure support approach approaches about five to six centimeters of water. And when the patient can tolerate this level, then the ventilator support then extubation can actually occur. And studies have actually shown that the pressure support ventilation actually is going to reduce the number of days on mechanical ventilation compared to the spontaneous intermittent uh, mandatory ventilation modes. And it can actually be used in conjunction with the SIMV mode in patients that are being weaned off the mechanical ventilation. So these two modes, coupling them together, actually is a very good thing, especially for patients that are too weak or those that have underlying chronic illnesses. Again, here, the initial, remember the initial settings that we usually use for the pressure support, ventilation with the purpose of the spontaneous breathing trial, are going to give a driving pressure of about 5 to 8 centimeters of water, a peak expiratory pressure of 5 to 8 centimeters of water, a fraction of inspired oxygen must be equal to or less than 40%. And the pressure support ventilation mode for the respiratory uh, support and appropriate backup control rate and ventilator alarms have to be set. So we're going to be setting uh, an amount of pressure support. When this patient actually initiates a breath, there's some sort of pressure that is going to be created by the machine to ensure that at least you push in some tidal volume in the patient. Then the preferred method actually of weaning the patient off is the spontaneous breathing trial. So here you just disconnect the patient, you just switch off the machine, like I said in the initial joke at the beginning of this lecture. So this is an attempt to actually gauge how the patient may actually do if the patient is actually immediately disconnected from the ventilator. So we call this as a sink or swim method. They throw you into a swimming pool, you either sink or you swim. So the key is to actually withdraw this ventilator support while you still continue giving them oxygen, maybe you connect it to an outlet on the wall. So this is the simplest form or the simplest form of this spontaneous uh, breathing trial is known as a T piece trial. So the patient is actually disconnected from the ventilator and the endotracheal tube or the tracheostomy is going to be connected to a flow of oxygen system, which is usually a wall outlet or even an oxygen tank. So the transition from the ventilator tubing to the new tubing is going to be attached to the oxygen outlet and this requires extra work and the patient should be monitored by a respiratory therapist because if you don't do this well, you're going to cause more damage to the patient. So in most studies, about 80% of the patient actually receiving mechanical ventilation do not actually require prolonged weaning. So the observation actually explains why this one here is a useful and actually practical method of weaning patients off the ventilator. So this approach actually is the most successful in weaning uh, patients in most of the randomized controlled trials and is actually now the preferred approach to removing patients from the mechanical ventilation. It should last about 30 to 90 minutes and remember at the end of this you should evaluate the patient uh, for possible extubation because um, you should also look at the uh, blood pressure, the respiratory rate, the heart rate and the gases exchange because if you don't address these things and they worsen, the patient will endure certain complications. So this spontaneous breathing trail must only be done once a day. You don't want to do it more than once because if you keep disconnecting them, connecting them, you're going to be causing more harm than good. Now the last part of this lecture, I know it was a very, very long lecture, I do apologize. So the complications of mechanical ventilation could be either due to endotracheal intubation, they could be due to mechanical ventilation, they could be due to prolonged immobility and inability to eat normally. So the most effective way actually to reduce the complications of mechanical ventilation is to limit the uh, how long this patient is actually kept on the mechanical ventilation. So you may give them the sedation holidays to skip certain doses of the sedatives and and spontaneous breathing trials actually can help you determine the earliest point at which when you can disconnect this patient from the vent. Complications relating to intubation include increased risk of sinusitis, though this is not of significant clinical importance. You may develop ventilator-associated pneumonia. You should suspect if they have purulent tracheoaspirate in a febrile patient who has an elevated white cell count above 48 for above 48 hours, after the ventilation has begun, you should suspect this ventilator-associated pneumonia. Remember, these tend to be quite nasty, so often cover them on um, 
things that are going to be preventing pseudomonas and even the uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So you want to elevate the head end of the bed by 30 degrees to, re to reduce the risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Other complications of intubation include tracheostenosis, vocal cord injury, tracheoesophageal as well as tracheovascular fistula, though both of these are quite rare. Then complications in relation to mechanical ventilation are going to include pneumothorax and pneumatocils. You may have oxygen toxicity. Remember, if you keep someone on an oxygen concentration greater than 50% of a fraction of inspired oxygen, there are free radicals that you'll create. Inflammatory changes, alveolar infiltration, and even pulmonary fibrosis can develop. So remember, toxicity is both due to the concentration and it's time dependent. So it means a fraction of inspired oxygen greater than 60% should be avoided unless if it's necessary for survival. So uh, and a fraction of inspired, of inspired oxygen less than 60% is going to be tolerated for long periods of time. Sometimes you may have ventilator-associated lung injury or the valley. Remember the alveoli and the small airways are going to be related to mechanical ventilation. So it may sometimes be due to the alveoli being over distended, what we call volute trauma. It may be due to those repetitive collapsing, inflation and shearing forces that may uh, be happening in the alveoli. We call that as atelectotrauma. And this is either of these is going to be causing these inflammatory mediators to be released. This is going to be increasing the alveolar permeability. It's going to cause fluid accumulation and even loss of surfactant. Another complication that is related to mechanical ventilation is hypotension. I think I already talked about this. Remember, in those patients that are mechanically ventilated, it means that you're increasing the thoracic pressures, so the venous return is reduced. So you should suspect this in a patient that has tachycardia and has a sudden increase in the peak, peak inspiratory pressure. So you should consider they may have developed a tension pneumothorax, so you should examine the person's chest, order a chest x-ray, and immediate treatment is indicated if the examination confirms this. Then more commonly, the hypotension may be due to sympatholysis that is going to be caused by the sedatives and the opioids that are given. Usually this is facilitate, this, uh, these are often given to facilitate intubation and ventilation. Remember that hypotension can also be caused by an increase in, or rather decrease in the venous return because of the high intrathoracic pressures. These, especially patients that have high levels of PEEP or in those patients that have high intrinsic PEEP or auto PEEP that is due to asthma or COPDs. So if there is no physical findings that is suggestive of attention pneumothorax and if ventilation related causes of hypotension are a possible etiology, then you should do a chest x-ray and the patient may actually be disconnected from the ventilator and you bag them manually with about two to three breaths per minute with 100% oxygen. Wireless, you're giving fluids about 500 to 1,000 mils of normocelline in adults and 20 mils per kg in, in children. Then, of course, an immediate improvement in the ventilation, uh, really, uh, is, uh, an immediate improvement in the patient is going to suggest that there's a ventilation related cause. And, of course, the ventilator settings should be adjusted accordingly. Then, if you keep a patient too long, they're immobile and they're not eating. You may develop DVTs, venous thromboembolic disease like DVT, pulmonary embolism. So these patients must be covered on DVT prophylaxis like a clexane, which is a low molecular weight heparin, or heparin 5,000 units subcutaneously two to three times a day. Or if the heparin is contraindicated, you may use sequential compression devices or even fondaparinix. Then sometimes they may have complications of skin breakdown and decubitus ulcers. This is usually prevented by two hourly turning and um, sometimes they may have a telectasis. Sometimes they may have GIT ulcers and GI bleeding. So often we may cover them on a histamine type 2 blocker like famotidine, 20 milligrams enterally or even IV twice a day. Also crophate, one gram enterally four times a day. We want to reserve the proton pump inhibitors for the patients that actually have pre-existing indications for them or those that are actively bleeding. So routine nutritional evaluation is actually mandatory and even the enteral feedings should be initiated if the ongoing mechanical ventilation is anticipated. I really hope you enjoyed this very long lecture on mechanical ventilation. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to never miss such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.